Welcome. It's great to see so many people here this evening. Uh, my name is Holly Rivers, and I'm the Associate Director at the Kellogg Institute for International Studies here at the University of Notre Dame. And for those who might be unfamiliar with our institute, we are a research institute that focuses on the themes of democracy and inter international development. And we're a community of faculty, faculty across the university, across the country and the world who focus on those themes, but also a community of graduate students and undergraduate students. And it's great to see a representation of all those groups here this evening. I am here to introduce our speaker and um, Professor Ruth ben Giet, who is a professor of history and Italian studies at New York University. She's a scholar of fascism, authoritarianism, war and propaganda, and has received many fellowships for her work, including a Fulbright and a Guggenheim. She's a political commentator and a cultural critic who appears frequently on radio, on podcasts and television and online programming, including the Washington Post, the New Yorker and CNN. She is also the author of seven books and the most recent is Strong Men, Mussolini to the Present, a book which just came out late last year and has been drawing a lot of attention. Her talk this evening will focus on propaganda and personality cults from Mussolini to the present. And I should note that it is co-sponsored with the Nanovic Institute for European Studies and the Center for Italian Studies at the university. One other note before I hand this over to her is that my work at the university focuses on undergraduate students. So undergraduates out there, we're hoping to have a good long question and answer period and I'm looking to you as part of that question and answer period. Um, with that, I will hand it over to our guest, Professor Ben Giet. Thank you. And thanks everybody for coming. Uh, thank you to Holly Rivers and Therese Handlin of the Kalelig Institute and everyone at the Nanovic Institute and Charles uh, Levitt and the Center for Italian Studies. Ours is the age of the strongman leader. And by this term, uh, I'm referring to a subset of authoritarians, heads of state who damage or destroy democracies and use masculinity as a tool of political legitimacy. And such rulers now govern in Turkey and Brazil and Russia and India, and until recently in the United States as well. I wrote Strongman because I felt it was time to look back at the evolution of authoritarianism over a hundred years. Because we're living in a period of intense historical revisionism about authoritarian history, from Putin making mention of the Nazi Soviet pact illegal in Russia and putting up statues to Stalin, to the belief enshrined in t-shirts you could buy on Amazon that Pinochet did nothing wrong, referring to the Chilean dictator who tortured people. When we Google leaders like Mussolini, it is still often their own images, their own propaganda that we see their own self carefully crafted self presentations and newsreels and videos of crowds cheering them. We don't see what happens to those who didn't show up uh, when you got the postcard uh, who to become props for these leaders spectacles. I wanted to look with new eyes at the commonplaces about authoritarianism, including that it's efficient uh, system of governance and good for business. And this project was made all the more urgent by the arrival of Trump on the political scene in America. So Strongman is the first book to put Donald Trump in historical context of a century of rule and how it changes from through, through history. So the book is structured around three periods of Strongman rule, the fascist era, the age of military coups, and I have Pinochet in Chile and Gaddafi in Libya, and then what I call the new authoritarian age, which starts with the end of the Cold War. So the 1990s to the present. And I focus on Berlusconi in Italy and Trump in America. So they did not destroy democracy. And then Putin in Russia and um, Erdogan in Turkey comes in and out as well. So there are three phases of history also, how they rise, how they rule and how they fall. And the core of the book is an examination of what I call the authoritarian playbook. They're tools of rule. And each chapter is about a different tool and it goes over a hundred years. So propaganda, corruption, machismo, the myth of national greatness, 
and violence. So the reader can take, for example, I'm gonna talk about propaganda, see what has stayed the same over a hundred years, like personality cults, and what has changed, obviously, from newsreels to up to Twitter and Instagram. So I also have a chapter on resistance, which was a relief to get to after writing about so many grim things and how resistance uh, tactics have changed over a century and then how these leaders fall. So I'll zoom in on propaganda for this talk as a case study of the tools of rule. And information media have changed over a century, but many of the strategies stay the same. And I'm going to share my screen so you will see me at the end of the talk again. Okay. This was just my first slide with, uh, this is a Proud Boys rally. So we have the Confederate flag and uh, this t-shirt Pinochet did nothing wrong, um, which so you see that in today's, this is why I felt that a, a book that's a, of global sp scope is very important because this isn't just about American history. There is an entire um, history of the global right, right-wing authoritarianism. And except for Gaddafi, and he's there because of his links to Berlusconi and Mussolini, um, most of the people in the book are right-wing authoritarians. So this is important for the scope of what we're facing today in terms of threats to democracy. So for 100 years, authoritarian leaders have invested in propaganda to convince people to believe their lies, to participate in their corruption and accept their racism and violence as normal and necessary. And one interesting thing I found is, I, of course I knew Mussolini was a journalist, but many strong men, the ones who did well, came to power with experience in mass communication. So Mobutu Sezi Seko, in the Congo, who's also in my book, he, had, he was a professional journalist. Berlusconi, of course, had television networks and Trump had experience with marketing and television. Now, personality cults are key to the success of uh, authoritarian propaganda. They're very crucial. And early modern French and English monarchs encouraged the idea they had special powers known as the healing touch Personality cults are different. They, they are, I'm looking at 20, 20th century, these cults depend on uh, mass media and mass mobilization and mass surveillance. So the leader can seem omnipresent as well as possessed of magical properties. And it's very interesting that, that, that 20th century and 21st century personality cults, uh, something remains of this idea of the leader having a special, special powers and his body is special. These cults also share an important quality of celebrity. The object of desire must seem accessible, but also remote and untouchable. He's a man of the people and an every man, but he's also a superman. And many of them are said to, uh, or say that they are ruling by divine will. So here we have a billboard uh, in Libya um, and this says, uh, with you, we um, embrace glory. And so it's important that it's the voice of the people. So Gaddafi always said he was in power by the will of the people, but he's looking to the heavens to receive divine inspiration. And this is important. And um, most of these strong men uh, are embraced by religious institutions that uh, accord them a kind of divine mandate to rule. And that's been, a, that's been a, a through line in personality cults. And here we have, Trump has had support of evangelical Christians and also Orthodox Jews, both of whom believe that he was placed in rule uh, in office uh, by divine mandate to save the country. At its core, propaganda is a set of communication strategies designed to sow confusion and uncertainty discourage critical thinking, and persuade people that reality is what the leader says it is. Over a century, the strategies have stayed the same, even as information mediums have changed. From Mussolini's use of newsreels to Trump's and Bolsonaro's use of Twitter, authoritarians have had direct communications channels with the public, and this is very important for building their personality cult, 
that it's an unmediated channel, a mediated channel for their voice to reach the people. And so they pose as authentic interpreters of the popular will. Rallies, of course, have also been a favored means of contact, but rulers use radio, newsreels, television, now social media to help them maintain their charismatic authority and turn politics into an aesthetic experience with them as the stars. So the, over a century, the communication codes and celebrity cultures, because they become like the Devo, uh, the, the chief male star of their country. And so these celebrity cultures, including now digital storytelling, shape the leader's self-presentation and the images he releases of himself and his followers. But whatever the medium, a paradoxical truth holds. The more skilled the leader is at this mediatized politics, the more his admirers see him as authentic and feel a personal connection with him. Now, propaganda might seem to be all about noise, but silence and absence are equally important. Strong men disappear people, but they also disappear knowledge that conflicts with their ideologies and goals. Pinochet closed down social science and philosophy departments, and Orban in Hungary has banned gender studies. All 21st century authoritarians suppress climate change science because it discourages the plunder of national resources that generate profits for them and their cronies. Now, Mussolini, and here's, uh, this was, Mussolini is always right, this was one of the fascist slogans. And I'm just showing you this, you see it was, you would encounter it uh, in daily life. This was at the entrance to an exhibition uh, but there would be posters on the street telling you uh, or in your classroom and your workplace that Mussolini was always right. And Mussolini, uh, you know, Hitler gets a lot of attention for obvious reasons, but Mussolini was really the pioneer in, uh, in the strongman template. And Hitler watched him very carefully uh, and admired him greatly over the 1920s. The launch of the star system in Hollywood and Europe influenced his image and his marketing and film was silent until the very early 1930s. So Mussolini's skill at gesticulation and using his body on camera made him a kind of star. And he was an international star in, in uh, the US as well. And he was also a pioneer in the art of body display. And he loved to go shirtless for the cameras. Starting in 1933, he would appear uh, it, at his summer, so here's winter shirtless, and here's summer, where he would actually, this is interesting, because he would send out these almost like a fan card, where, where as though he was a Hollywood star signed, and this is during his vacation in Riccione, and he's looking through a handheld camera, so he liked to show he was in control of the gaze, but he's letting his adoring fans admire his, his uh, very scantily clothed body. And he, rem he remained the lone um, example until we get to Putin, who rivals him for this kind of bodily display. And here we have very famous um, newsreel called uh, The Duce is Threshing Wheat. And, and Mussolini basically it's, uh, stripped off his shirt uh, and started to thresh wheat. And what's so uh, interesting about this, it was the first time a head of state had engaged in manual labor in a state of undress in the camera. And it was a sensation, so he repeated it several times uh, uh, later. And what was typical was here he's doing a very ancient activity. And yet he's got on these like cool modern goggles. And this is not exactly a peasant's hat. So in his body, he reconciled the tensions between tradition and modernity. And the strong man's body is always a bearer of values, but uh, also tensions within, they make themselves to be what the culture needs them to be. That's a very important point. They will be whatever the you need them to be. And so they, they uh, will say one thing in the morning and the opposite uh, in the afternoon. And uh, even in their bodily image, they reconcile these tensions. So um, Mussolini never stopped being a journalist. And in a way he was editor in chief of Italy 
He spent hours every day reading the newspapers, looking to punish critics and anyone who didn't praise him enough. And he dictated front page layouts, even down to what fonts to use. And by 1931, daily directives told journalists exactly what to say and who to ignore. A 1939 order read, don't have headlines with question marks. And that's very interesting. You were never supposed to have a question mark in a newspaper headline because you have to lock down meaning. The, strong, the strongman state in the fascist era in the 20th century should never leave room for doubt. And if we look at uh, Hitler, he had some advantages over Mussolini uh, because he had no Pope inside. He had no King with independent messaging uh, operations. Germany was also had a much higher literacy rate and more newspapers, uh, way more newspapers than Italy. And above all, Hitler had Goebbels and Mussolini didn't, he was so savvy on his own, he didn't have a Goebbels figure, but Hitler had Goebbels who drew on advertising techniques such as repetition and crowd psychology. Um, and the Nazis used radio very uh, effectively to uh, build the Hitler cult as well, as well as rituals as we know, like the Hitler salute. And Hitler's voice um, was, uh, you know, it, he used it in a very uh, unique manner. It was so laden with emotions, it still thought. And people thought that he was saying what they didn't even know they longed to express. So the, the public performance of these um, strongmen is very, very important. And Hitler, like all of them, he worked very hard on his charisma. So this idea that they have a natural charisma is uh, not always right. They work very hard at seducing and manipulating the public. So this is 1920s when uh, Hitler was trying to get to power and he was very frustrated because he couldn't get to power like his idol Mussolini. He took hypnotism lessons. He took voice lessons from actors. And he practiced his gestures, which uh, owe something to Weimar Expressionist cinema in the mirror. And that's a very interesting series of photographs by Heinrich Hoffmann, Hoffmann who became his official photographer. Uh, you can find them easily uh, if you Google, where he is practicing this theatrical gestures that made him famous. So we'll move to 21st century. And um, it's interesting to see what changes and what stays the same. So 21st century authoritarians mix rallies and censorship and personality cults, so things from the past, with social media to create the news they need to stay in office. Now holding elections, because now you come in through elections and you manipulate elections to stay in power. Uh, military coups are less common today. So they have to hold elections and it's not as cool to have mass force violence in public on your people. So they're more dependent than ever on the manipulation of information. So of course they still silence and kill critics, but they also flood the media space with noise and confusion, drowning out messages that may threaten their power. And many of them leave as Putin and especially Orban, uh, they leave a pocket of opposition, but they have to create confusion and they use smear campaigns and they use disinformation. And so this is one way propaganda has changed. So Mussolini censored banned question marks and headlines, right? To lock down the meaning. The Putin playbook, the political warfare and information warfare playbook that Trump also uses, it creates question marks around everything. And so this is, we can talk about this in the question and answer, this is one of the goals of modern our contemporary disinformation and conspiracy theories. They become part of governing policy for propagandists. So Berlusconi was somewhat of a pioneer here. Um, he had more influence over public opinion than anyone since Mussolini because he owned television networks and advertising uh, companies. He had a media empire. Um, and we sometimes forget this. He hasn't been in power since 2011 but um, he owned commercial television networks that commanded a majority of broadcast audiences in a country where by 2007, when he was in power, he wasn't, when he was around, when he was in power, 
87% of Italians got their information from television. So he had a huge influence. He also brought the personality cult into the new age. He evoked Il Duce very consciously with slogans. Uh, the slogan in fascist years was thank goodness for Mussolini and his was thank goodness for Silvio. And so he did very well uh, being a business tycoon and a sports uh, team owner, this combination of every man and Superman. And this is the secret of personality cults. So Italy was so saturated with his image that a woman interviewed in the early 2000s by Italian psychologists studying dementia could no longer recognize her family's face, but knew Berlusconi's along with those of Jesus Christ and the Pope. So Berlusconi laid down a formula for um, authoritarian executive rule in a democracy. And he remade politi Italian political culture. He brought the far right into government. He detained migrants. He promoted the agendas of Putin. And he exercised this kind of personalist leadership in a nominal open society. And propaganda was very uh, crucial to his success in doing this. So he laid down a formula that Trump would repeat in 2016. And here he is with Putin. He was very at a very, that's a real precedent that we don't, Americans certainly don't know enough about the whole Putin Berlusconi thing. So now I'll get to Trump. Um, and Trump has continued this, this kind of roster repertoire of propaganda uh, with the rallies, uh, with disinformation, with the personality cult, which I don't think we've come to terms with the strength of his personality cult. And these are unfamiliar, um, unfamiliar realities to, and concepts to think about for Americans as though it can't possibly be here that somebody would have a personality cult, that's in North Korea. But in, in fact, uh, this is my, my argument, he's, he's got a very effective personality cult. But he's very different than um, any American president. In fact, he is, he's not interested in, he was never interested in being a democratic with a small d ruler because he has devoted a huge amount of effort to destroying the meaning of truth in the absolute. He didn't have the media control enjoyed by Mussolini or Berlusconi or Putin or Erdogan. So he had to work really hard to influence public opinion. So he doesn't just lie about one or two things, but facts on any subject that conflict with his goals are degraded through rumor, innuendo, they're altered, fabricated or denied. And so, as you know, the number of documented falsehoods he uttered over his four years in office rose every year from an average of 5.9 in 2017 to 22 a day in 2019. And this is hard to, we have, we have faced a barrage of misinformation that is unprecedented in American history. 30,000 falsehoods that have been documented over his four years of president. So recently uh, when he's been saying he won the election, there's been this concept about the big lie, but the big lie only works if the public's been fed thousands of small lies, including about the leader's credibility. So we can talk about that after. And it was a re really big deal that Trump was banned from Twitter because this was what newsreels were for the fascist. It was a direct channel to the people that kept him constantly in the news. And it offered a curated sense of authenticity with the misspelled words and the caps, very idiosyncratic, very him. So people would say it's Trump being Trump. Now, in conclusion, Trump does differ from strongmen who came before him because he relies almost exclusively on television for information about the world. Now, Berlusconi was a master of television, but he read, he read his briefing books, he read books, Trump is formed entirely by television. And so we have to talk about, you know, how uh, the changes that have come to our media environment by uh, that now the values of politicians are, how much are they influenced by getting attention in the media the way that Trump did so successfully. So I just want to conclude um, that we, as time, uh, as his rule recedes, 
we will appreciate more what a skilled propagandist he was. And in fact, he surrounded himself with people like Roger Stone, who have decades of experience in psychological warfare, who worked for dictators. He worked for Roger Stone and Paul Manafort, worked for Ferdinand Marcos. They worked for Mobutu. Uh, Manafort worked for Putin. These are people who know what they're doing. And Trump uh, both has his own innate skills and he was coached by people who are experts in disinformation. Uh, again, decades of experience. So this, um, this all matters right now because we are about to start his Senate impeachment trial for incitement. And it's very much about what is the role of propaganda, the link between words and action, um, inc inciting through speeches, through violent rhetoric. Is there a link to the actual violent acts since he wasn't there committing them? And this is uh, all, all strong men have had skills of plausible deniability. Um, and this is a still, this is a picture of the rally and a propaganda film was shown at this rally. And um, it's very important, his leader cult, because at the rally, he told his followers that he loved them, that they were special. He said, our journey is just beginning together. And this was right before the assault. The last frame, <laughs> If you study fascist uh, cinema, this might spook you. This is the frame's final, in, the film's final frame. It just trumps face. And when I saw this, I was floored and freaked out because one of the <laughs> films I wrote about, very obscure film in my 2015 book, uh, ends with a Mussolini surrogate um, face. And this is uh, Fosco Giacchetti playing a Mussolini type figure. And so all you see is his face because that's the only reality you need. The, the leader is the arbiter of reality. And in this film, he says, now we begin right here. And Trump said, we're only beginning our journey together. And then the crowd went to the Capitol. So <laughs> I'll end with that um, and ready to, take questions. Great, you leave us with quite an image there. <laughs> yes, I, I, was, um, I was shocked when I, uh, and I went scurrying through my uh, computer because I remember I had that image of the face in my book and I have a, a Gilles Deleuze wrote about the face on film. And I, anyway, there's a whole theorization in my book about what it means to end the film with just this person's face, blotting out all other reality. And then here we go with Trump. Uh, that's a Trump made White House made film. Um, so very eerie. Well, we wanted to open this up now to questions. And so as Teresa Hanley mentioned at the very beginning, um, what we'd like to do is have you raise your hand virtually, um, if you don't mind. And I um, would love to start with an undergraduate student, if I can. Um, and I think that I have one out there. Um, Sam, I think I'm right about this, but Sam Canova, are you, uh, if you want to go ahead and speak, that would be great. Definitely, thanks so much. Re really really an interesting an interesting talk you took us through. Um, so, so I'm curious, it, it seems as though maybe we can, we can draw like a, a then and now from like Mussolini to Trump. Um, and, I, and I'm really curious to, to hear a bit more of your thoughts on strongmen as, as consumers, as well as producers of propaganda. So to, to sort of paint, paint then, then and now a little further, it seemed that for, for Mussolini, um, strongmen in, in his era had, had the chance to be much more um, of the producers setting the tone and the message and the mode of the propaganda. Whereas now, as, as you noted, um, we're seeing Donald Trump reportedly watching Fox and Friends for four hours every morning. Um, we're seeing like QAnon and conspiracies coming up and, and being distributed separate from the strong man himself, though, though often like in the same direction or, or um, with like currents of support. Um, so I, I'm, I'm curious, are, are you starting to see these strong men becoming consumers of propaganda as well? Um, and yeah. how might that work? I mean, propaganda works through, uh, there's a couple of principles about it. One is repetition, but the other is circulation. 
and ideally saturation. Now that we're not in, you know, except North Korea, China, and some other places, we don't have these closed, closed societies with state media. So you don't have the monopoly power because the, the word in the fascist years was synchronization where prop propaganda works best when the same message with small variations is being repeated and and f channeled through different institutions of society. So you get the same message from the schools, from church, from everywhere. And that kind of saturation and synchronization isn't really possible uh, as easily in, even in Putin's Russia or Turkey of Erdogan. Um, you have to have a society more like North Korea to do that. But um, it's a very interesting question you pose about uh, the, the strongmen as the consumer. And um, strongmen are very interesting because they are sponges and all of them, they're, they get where they are because they are uh, amoral and they are opportunists and they pick up, they read the market, they read the themes that society is interested in. And they, when I said they'll be whatever you need them to be, part of that is picking up the messages that are going to work. So Trump, for example, was always a racist, but he realized also that there was this extremist market that he could, so he started echoing, he started retweeting them. He, the, the first piece I ever wrote on Trump for CNN was in November, 2015, uh, when he retweeted neo-Nazi propaganda. I thought, uh-oh, that's not good. So he's been a consumer um, of these things, perhaps for a very long time. Um, but Trump is some, uh, different than everybody else because he's so saturated by TV because normally it's like in Putin's Russia, it's the leader says something and the state disseminates it. What happens with Trump is that he had a feedback loop with Fox so that Sean Hannity would say something or Tucker Carlson and two minutes later, Trump would tweet that. And if you think about Twitter being the official archive of record of a presidential's, presidential utterances, a lot of those ideas were actually coming from Fox and then consumed by Trump and fed back to the population by the president. So, they're in, so as, we, as social media uh, makes the, circ, the circulation of information so much faster, and there's somebody like Trump who absorbs everything as a marketer and spits out what is more, what is most useful, what's going to get him more followers. Um, he, the, he becomes more of a consumer, in fact, than somebody like Mussolini. Although they, again, they always were able to pick up what was most um, relevant in the culture. Um, Hitler was a bit more rigid. Uh, he's a little bit different. Uh, but think about Modi, who uses Instagram. And so they, they, they echo what is most vibrant in the culture, uh, often vibrant in a bad way, but <laughs> like, like neo-Nazi stuff. So that's, that's part of it, but that's a great question. Thanks, and thank you, Sam, for getting us started. Um, I, I see, and forgive me if I don't pronounce your name correctly, but I believe it's Alberta Vitale. And you're on mute. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, my question is a, a, a double sword, a double edged sword. Actually, I know from my little uh, reading that I have of uh, uh, Benito, um, I do know that uh, one of the things that he did was to uh, uh, set up a situation where we, he became uh, a, a godlike presence. And um, one of the things that he knew that he had to do was to um, at least uh, provide some some positive things for the Italians at the time. One of which had to do with um, I know that when he marched into um, I'm not I don't remember if it was Milan or Rome, but when he he and his uh, brown shirts marched into uh, power, that one of the things that he professed was that he was going to uh, in Italian it roughly or in, in, in English it roughly translates into I'm going to drain the swamp which was to drain the Pontine, uh, Pontine, Pontine marshes in Rome. So he apparently did that because, uh, you know, the infestation of mosquitoes and so on and so forth was a, was a scourge on the Italians. 
And then he, um, then he also uh, said that he was going to um, uh, make the trains run on time. So he did do that. So all of a sudden, the Italians thought, well, this guy can do some really positive things. Um, one of the things that I'm curious about, though, is once that a person like him gains power, um, it appears that uh, getting rid of these, uh, these, this whole cult and the, and the person that leads the cult is almost impossible to remove. And usually it ends up in some kind of a violence act. Uh, Mussolini, for example, um, with the, uh, uh, the troops, the Allied troops coming in, into uh, uh, Italy and also uh, Benito Mussolini having been hanged, uh, hanged in the public square and so on and so forth for the public to see. Um, I wonder uh, if, uh, if our lecturer uh, uh, can, can give us a hint as to how she sees what's going to happen next in the America, because I don't know how how uh, in an in American uh, democracy that we have, such as the one we have, I know this is a long question, but in, in, our, in our situation, uh, how does our lecturer see this going forward? How, how is this going to end in her opinion? Or how will, how will we be able to get rid of this if, if that's the uh, desire of the American? Um. So the book, the interest, the most interesting chapter, um, you, you would like the book if you read it because I address the draining the swamps business um, and the trains run on time business. And I'll just say one thing about that because the trains run on time is only possible because you have, um, you have propaganda and you have censorship because uh, uh, no one was allowed to know what the real, uh, modernity of the trains was, what the real efficiency of the trains was because of censorship. Uh, you weren't allowed to publish notice of late trains. Of There were no strikes allowed. There were no works, <laughs> work shutdowns. Um, all of this, no accidents. That was actually an official category prohibited dimension was train accidents. So um, there's that. But the, yes, so I had to turn in my book in the summer of 2020. I had time to include the Black Lives Matter protests and the state's reaction to them with Lafayette Square. And the last thing I said about Trump is that he's not going to leave quietly, that he will do everything to stay in office, because I didn't know what would happen, but I was very sure about that. And so when January 6th happened, and it wasn't just January 6th, it was it's very interesting because what he did uh, after he wouldn't accept the results, he actually drew from all of the eras of authoritarian history. Uh, first, he thought about the military, you know, and then General Millet, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, shut that down. So that was the age of military coups. And then electoral manipulation, he tried that for months. And that's what people like Putin and Erdogan do today. So none of it worked. And then he did the nuclear option, which is very similar to early fascism, where you have the, the leader is the victim and they come to rescue you. And that was January 6th. So I think that it's very important to come to terms with the strength of Trump's personality cult, because uh, in the same way that the Senate refused to uh, convict him last time, um, and it's very sad that um, uh, a, a Democratic Senator, Cheryl Brown, interviewed his colleagues last year, and they told him that they acquitted uh, Trump because they were afraid. So we have an authority, the GOP is an authoritarian uh, political culture at this point. It's really, it's a far right party. And there's very interesting comparative study, comparative politics studies now. Uh, there's one by Pippa Norris at Harvard and many others that are coming out that that show the platform and the rhetoric and the methods used by the GOP are not conservative, they're far right. So this is a big problem going forward. One of our two parties is really an authoritarian leaning party. Um, and so I don't expect them to, I expect them to acquit Trump again. And I also have, before January 6th, I, I forecast that Trump would act as a kind of outside extremist agitator that's, that's his best thing. He knows how to be an agitator. He's always done that. 
So it's very uh, worrisome because the playbook is uh, to try and make the U.S. as unstable as possible and depict the Biden-Harris administration as unable to govern. And this creates more uh, appetite for law and order strongman governance, whether it's going to be Trump or whoever it's going to be. So that's how I see those are the dangers. But we also, to, so people aren't like totally depressed, um, which sometimes happens after interviews with me. Um, we've also, we did something no one has done practically in history. We voted out a strongman in the middle of his process of authoritarian capture. Had there been a second term would have been very bad news for many reasons. And we voted him out against all odds in the middle of a pandemic. So he left a roadmap for undoing democracy, but he also left a roadmap uh, uh, with the, the, his, his opponents have a roadmap for how to defend it. I appreciate that you gave us something positive right there at the end. So yes, <laughs> very important. So we have um, a few questions. Um, Fritz Heinzen and Trevor, I think I'm gonna have the two of them both go and then we'll come back to the, the next few people that are up. So Fritz, you're first and then Trevor. Thank you. And, and thank you for a very interesting talk. If nothing else, you've got a sale of a book today. I'm, I'm actually rather interested in seeing it because the fact that you're moving across such a broad sweep of time, well, even, even though it's just 100 years, there are plenty of interesting case studies that you're mentioning. And um, a, as a historian, I'm, I'm more familiar with Hitler, Mussolini, and so on. I'm a European historian. And, and lately, I've been reading Peter Pomerantsov yeah. And in fact, I've even done a seminar with him to try to catch up on the more modern, yeah. Putin especially. And, and so I'm sort of curious if you have any th thoughts on Peter Pomerantia, but that's, that's not my main, my main question is, is this, along these lines, I'm maybe detecting there's something similar to most of these strongmen. And don't their egos eventually overwhelm their competence at managing their propaganda? They, they turn on their own advisors, Propaganda eventually becomes so ham-handed. And yet in the end, and this is what I'm wondering, if most of these strongmen eventually believe their propaganda, because it seems like they all, they become very dysfunctional. They lose their wars, they, they, mm -hmm. they are thrown out. So I'm just curious about that. And then just very, very quickly, you know, a sentence or two, are you gonna update this book? Mm -hmm. and, and then last and not least, are you gonna add maybe possibly some from the left because there's some very interesting authoritarian leaders from the left. And I'm, uh, I would be curious if you see differences from those on the right. Thank um, you. That's great. And your background, by the way, is amazing. Um, your virtual background. Um, so I, did, I chose not to um, put uh, left-wing uh, strongmen in there except for Gaddafi because I chose people who have a connection uh, among each other. And I wanted to show through lines between, for example, fascists. And then when the fascists died, neo-fascists and Nazis went to Franco Spain and then they went to Pinochet's Chile. So I wanted to show these things. Um, also, I had to delineate this somehow or else it becomes like a, a, an encyclopedia. Um, so there's that. Um, there will be an update of the book because it's sold out on Amazon. So there's a reprint, but there's going to be a paperback early uh, coming, I think, uh, in the fall. And I will be able to bring it up to today. So I'm happy about that. There'll be an epilogue, basically. So your question is very interesting. I was, um, I was shocked to see how similar um, across space and time the governance structures uh, very dysfunctional governance structures established by these types of rulers are because all of them create these inner circles around themselves that are filled with sycophants and flatterers and family members, right? There's a whole paragraph in my book about sons-in-law uh, and family, of course, will conspire with you. You can trust them. And so after, over time, and they hire and they fire people constantly. And if you're too competent or you tell them the truth, you get demoted or fired or go to prison. And this creates a bubble around the ruler 
and he starts to believe his own propaganda. He, his worst impulse is his hubris, his myth of being um, competent at everything. You know how Trump says, I can master nuclear policy in five minutes. Um, Mussolini was the same and Mussolini always occupied five different, at least five ministries, as well as being head of state. Most famously, when he went into World War II against the advice of all his generals, because Italy wasn't ready, uh, he was minister of war, uh, Air Force, Navy, you know, he was, he was overextended. And so they make bad decisions and they think that they're infallible. And so the psychology of the strongman, I don't get in, I don't use psychological terms, but the psychology and the personality traits of the strongman, and this was, they're all the same. They all do the same things. Even uh, those who had a reputation for being unflappable, like Pinochet, because he's a military general, he, he had constant reshufflings of his cabinet. He had a huge anger problem. He'd hire and fire people at the slightest whim. So he had this son-in-law was in charge of privatization. It, it, they're all the same. So when Trump came and the, the news stories start to come out about him acting in the same way, this was just like, okay, I've seen this before and it doesn't end well. So this is, you know, this is, this is what, what you see and it's never good for the nation. Thank you. Trevor, I think we had a hint that you were out there a moment ago. So Trevor, who's one of our undergraduate students, you're next. Uh, thank you very much for the, for, the, for the interesting talk. I have two quick questions. Uh, so where, where I come from, uh, propaganda actually has no value attached to it. Whether you're in opposition or a government, everybody is taking a set of information or facts, if you will, uh, and communicating them how they wish to elicit a certain kind of response from the populace, their constituents. Uh, and that happens both with the uh, regimes that could be classified as democratic, opposition political parties that are you know, pushing against uh, autocratic regimes. So I was just wondering uh, when propaganda becomes bad, because if a uh, politics, you know, thought, thinking of it, especially in electoral regimes, autocratic, democratic, if you think of politics as a game of numbers, everyone is trying to tune information in a certain direction. Uh, so I'm just wondering when, at least in, in, in the work you've done, that turns into uh, a bad thing. And then the other question is, uh, I wonder if uh, there is an attempt to read the authoritarian figures you look at within a, a historical context uh, in the sense that is, is it possible that their authoritarian actions are necessitated by the stage of development, advancement at which the societies in which they are find themselves? And that uh, the only way pro probably, for example, to hold a country together, I mean, there are several instances across, uh, across the world, the only way to hold a country together, for example, in Rwanda, you have to, uh, you know, tighten a bit. In, in, in a country as diverse as mine in Uganda, we've had the 74 several years, and I think uh, he fits this, uh, the, the handbook of authoritarians pretty well, uh, but an argument could be made that without some form of uh, extraordinary centralization of authority, uh, running a, a state in a country like that might be much more difficult. So is there some contextualization, historical one, where the authoritarian conduct is uh, necessitated by the objective concrete conditions obtaining in, in those places. Thank you. Those are excellent uh, questions. For the, for the first one about when is, because of course democratic states have propaganda too. In fact, I'm teaching a class right now, I just started on propaganda. And we, the, the title of the class is Propaganda in Dictatorships and Democracies. Um, but what I do in the book to, to answer this question is propaganda doesn't work on its own. It, it, it's part of authoritarianism when it is linked to the other tools, violence, corruption, machismo, 
um, and the myth being a myth of national greatness. So for example, the trains run on time example, um, you know, what is covered up by that propaganda, the fact that, uh, you know, the trains are breaking down, killing people, you can't talk about that. You're inflating the efficiency to make Mussolini seem like he's efficient. And this connects a little bit to your second question that this, and often that's, there are times in which uh, uh, there is indeed um, a chaos and uh, fragmentation and perhaps a centralization is needed, but it doesn't have to be, um, I personally never think that uh, repression, um, you know, institutionalized lying and repression and torture and mass imprisonment uh, are part, have to be part of that if you're well-intentioned. If you want good government, you might have to centralize more, but you don't have to lock up and kill um, opponents or commit genocide or uh, any of the other things that have happened with authoritarians over the years. So what I do in the book is show how the tools are connected. Um, so the myth of this efficient um, man is connected very much to the corruption because he becomes the man who gets away with everything, uh, draining the swamps. He's going to clean up Italy, for example, like Trump said, he's going to drain the swamp, uh, which was a cover for, you know, that, he, that he's an anti-globalist. Well, Trump is the most globalist person ever. All of them are. So with Putin, all the leaders who talk about anti-globalism and like America first, Russia first, they're all depending on either offshore finance or in Trump's case, foreign banks. Um, Erdogan's in debt up to his nose in foreign banks. So this is all hypocrisy. So that's why uh, each tool uh, can't be seen as in its full scope on its own. It has to be connected to the others. There are two people out there who've been incredibly patient. So Laura Jury is the next one. And then Peter Kostia, who I'm guessing is the father of one of my former students. So Laura, you're, you're up first. Hi there, thank you for your presentation. Um, I have a, a couple of quick points, one more central than the other. Um, the first was to say that I was really interested in the detail you included regarding uh, the strongman's background in the media. And I was wondering to what extent you would apply this to him to a person like Boris Johnson. Um, and I would connect this also in a way to my second a more major point, which is that um, something I've noticed among leaders such as um, leaders I would contemporarily associate with this strongman, Tim, is a, a failure to serve uh, their citizens in terms of the pandemic uh, and very high death rates. Um, and so I wondered, in a way, expanding upon an earlier question, um, how you see the election of Biden and Harris in relation to an international, on, on an international level, in terms of its international impact. Um, when Trump was elected, we talked a lot, we talked a lot about the election in relation to Brexit and um, this kind of global shift to the right. And I wondered, is it too simplistic to kind of prophesize about maybe a, a slight shift towards maybe the center and the left again. Um, and just by comparison with leaders, specifically female leaders who have been more successful in dealing with and managing this crisis. Um, okay, you have a lot of, you have three large questions. So I think without a doubt, uh, Boris Johnson's facility with the media He's also an exhibit A of this faux, po I call it faux populism, where he, you know, he's just disheveled and, and he's, he's very, he comes, he was a journalist. In fact, he, um, he was one of the people who, re who revived with Nicholas Farrell, a right-wing uh, hagiographer of Mussolini, this business of the trains running on time. And it was to Boris Johnson that Silvio Berlusconi gave a famous interview saying that, quote, Mussolini never killed anyone. He just sent people to holiday camps, like 
referring to, because the, the fascists used islands like Ponza, uh, Ustica, uh, and they were horrible places where torture was practiced. But so <laughs> Johnson knows what he's doing. Um, and he's, you know, he's been able to kind of, this is the same, this tension. He's very posh, but he, he, he's populist and he's posh and somehow it's all in the mix. Um, so, um, you know, the pandemic shut down something very important. Uh, there was um, civil resistance, mass public protest on a global scale in 2019 from Chile to Hong Kong, uh, all over many, many places in the world, a whole new generation of people came out to the streets. Uh, in Chile, they were the biggest protests since the, the, the Pinochet years. And this is, uh, these energies are not going away. Um, they're, they're sheltering at home, they're in lockdown <laughs> in some ways. But that's important, we, it's easy to forget about that. Um, and look, look at the Black Lives Matter protests in our country, um, where uh, these were protests that were multiracial, they were multi-generational. So this, this is evidence of, of a, a desire for social justice that's very, very strong. And I think that people know that the stakes are higher uh, all over the world now because of the success of the global right. Um, and because some of them have been in, long, in power long enough, even Bolsonaro, came in 2019, but he's been so destructive. People see what the stakes of bad governance is. And by bad, I, I don't, I'm not trying to be morally, it's, it's governance like, like Trump that where it costs lives and Bolsonaro where they denied the coronavirus and it, it, it has a mortality tax um, to it. So I'll, I'll stop there because those are answered most of the things. Okay, thank you. Peter, you're, you're up. Okay, am I unmuted? Yes. Hi. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, a couple questions. Uh, uh, one, um, were there any uh, early critiques of American democracy that pointed to the, the possibility of a, of a strong man uh, philosophy or uh, a psychology developing in, in our country, and if so, I mean, even maybe going back to the uh, uh, to the nineteenth century, and, and if so, what what were the, uh, the what did the critiques say about you know possible uh, uh, ways to deal with that? And then um, unrelated question: um, My virtual background is of uh, Dresden, Germany. Uh, Columbus is a, a sister city of Dresden, and I've, I've visited Dresden a number of times. And um, um, of course, in Germany. Um, um, I don't know that there's really been the emergence of a strong man uh, figure or strong person figure, uh, but there's a party that probably would greatly support it, uh, that being the alter mm -hmm. alternative for a Germany uh, party. Um, mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you maybe had any comments about, uh, uh, about the German society uh, right now and it's, it's, uh, it's uh, maybe possibility for developing a, a strong person a personality there. So I can't answer your first question because I'm not a historian of, of America. Um, so I really don't know. Um, my, my 19th century American history stopped at high school. So probably any of you know more than I do about that. Um, Germany, it's very, obviously very interesting because, uh, and it's very interesting comparison with Italy because Germany obviously had Nuremberg trials and uh, had denazification in a very vigorous manner uh, and very uh, strict uh, laws against, you know, Hitler salutes and uh, all the symbols and rituals connect uh, the outward manifestation of Nazism. Uh, Italy uh, was a very different story um, and um, politicians still pose under a, a, um, a, a painting of Mussolini, even like center left politicians, which is like Angela Merkel doesn't sit under uh, uh, a, a portrait of Hitler when she does an international press conference. Um, but Italians don't like to hear that. And I wrote an article in the New Yorker about this problem of fascist memory. And I was, uh, I was swarmed by thousands of irate um, Italians. But what's interesting about the German case is 
also the presence of women uh, in it. And this, this, Laura, this, Laura, this gets to your question too about, uh, and how there's even this kind of attempt to rejigger the right where there's room for some environmentalism, for some, uh, you know, female leadership. Uh, for uh, their version of pro-family politics. Um, and, but you also see there's a big problem just in the last few years, uh, the neo-Nazi uh, genie is out of the, whatever it's called, the, whatever it comes out of, I'm blanking on the name. But, and, and now there's a problem. I mean, there's more, many more open manifestations of pro-Nazi sy you know, sympathies now. And this is of course, because you know, there is this concerted effort, most of it funded by Putin, a lot of it funded by Putin um, to have you know, this, this right-wing politics is a global, it, it's occurring in a global framework. It's end game is global. All of these, uh, there's a network that, that links these right, these rights in Italy and in Germany. And uh, in, in Austria, the very young chancellor, former chancellor uh, Kurz, he said, and he, he chose his language carefully, he talked about an axis of the willing on immigration issues between Italy, Austria, and Hungary, all collaborationist, uh, uh, you know, of Nazism in World War II. And so, when you have people using that language of the axis, this was in 2018, um, this is a glo it's a, it's a, it's an international problem. So what's happening in, in Germany, it's very worrisome. Um, and it's, a, it's, it's acquiring a momentum it didn't have 10 years ago. We have um, one last question out there and this will be the last one that we take to today. And so Hillary, um, we'll, we'll let you We'll let you be that person. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, this is absolutely fascinating and I'm really glad that I, I joined and I am also like someone else said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy your book. So <laughs> thank you for thank your you. research and, and all your ideas and everything. Um, so um, I guess I wanna address the issue of illegitimate propaganda or you know, lie, the lies portion of the propaganda versus legitimate criticism of an existing government, to, to say it simplistically, or, or existing ideas. Um, and it, I, I'm thinking of, um, for example, you know, Trump and his minions, like Hannity and Carlson, Tucker Carlson, would raise um, the fear of socialism. And they mm -hmm. did really release that or uh, raise that in the election in the mm -hmm. election very strongly and, and really pushed that you know oh this is a threat to our economy and you know biden's gonna uh turn us all into you know communists i mean sometimes they even hijacked the word socialism and switched it over to communism you know mm -hmm. so they they kind of made exaggerated things um of course that was you know taking things too far um but as, as people that I know, such as family members would say, there certainly is at least a grain of truth to the argument that some of these policies that are being proposed by you know, Biden and the left in American politics um, you know, are somewhat socialism. Um, such as, for example, like the $15 minimum raise, wage raise um, proposal. And uh, it's, you know, some would say akin to the government supplementing people's wages. Um, my question is, do proposals such as the minimum wage raise do they help perpetuate the narrative of we must fear the opposition? Um, and, uh, you know, do we Americans need to be careful not to make, you know, drastic changes to the left as a reaction to the far 
write proposals that we all are horrified by and want to get rid of, you know, uh, in our in our society. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, if you look comparatively, we don't have much of a left in in this country, and a lot of the people. It's a strategy. Uh, of the Republican party to call people, like when they're calling Nancy Pelosi with her Chanel jacket and pearls, like this is not, I get called a radical leftist by the Wall Street Journal. I'm a liberal, I'm a pro-military liberal actually. I have nothing to do with the radical. So this is, this is part of what you were saying. This is, uh, this, it was very effective uh, to scare people. These are scare tactics and polarization uh, is what strong men and authoritarians need because you have to beat each other's throats. And the way you do that is to label anything that is threatening to you as left. And so what what you can't have is a middle. So where is the center where, and it could be liberals, it could be uh, progressives, but even progressives are not the left necessarily. These, these, they're not socialists. And but things like a $15 minimum wage, this is where America is a little unusual because this is just, it could be easily seen as giving people uh, dignity to live properly. It's not, it's not $50 minimum wage, but it gets tarred. The, the, the right is very, very expert uh, as the left has been in other countries at other times, of course. Um, but in our, in our um, context, it's, It's the right that's been very effective at um, labeling this. And one of the points that I make at the end of the book is liberals and centrists have not, and liberal democracy has not been very effective at tooting its own horn. If you think about the, like what, what, what comes to mind, like what graphic slogan or visual identity, maybe the Statue of Liberty. Um, We know what values attach to democracy but uh, it's the extremes that have been much better with their symbols, with their rituals. And if we wanna protect democracy, we need to recover that center um, so that proposals that might seem uh, that are branded as outlandish have, have, they have a place to be that's not the radical left. So I always try and see, look at what is being gained by pushing people away from each other into these extremes. And we know what the end of that playbook is, you know, you want to incite civil violence and then you can have uh, somebody come and have their law and order government. But that's, it's a very, uh, it's a lot to think about what you, what you raise. So thank you for that. Well, we want to thank you, Professor Van Giet, for being with us this evening for, for your talk, as well as for engaging with our audience and for your, and with the questions and answers. And, and for those of you who did not get enough this evening, there's an opportunity to hear from Professor too. tomorrow. Um, she will be doing a talk as part of the Kellogg Institute lecture series at 12.30 p.m on strong men and their exits, legacies of authoritarian rule. So you're welcome to join that talk as well. And we uh, very much appreciate seeing all of you this evening. So thank you. Thank you so much.